Okay, so a lot of people have asked me, um, Eric, how do you make bread? So we're gonna show you how to make bread today. Um, process is pretty complicated, it takes a really long time. I'm not gonna show you how to make the starter or the leaven. Uh, you gotta look that up on your own. It takes about a week or so to start the, the, the starter from scratch. You can also buy a starter from someone, borrow from someone, and then you can use that. Point is, it's, a, it's, a, it's an organism that you gotta feed and you gotta keep it alive. Um, by giving it regular feedings and using it, etc. So here what I have right here is uh, the beginning component of it, which is called the leaven. As you can see the leaven is just basically the, the starter that's been mixed for a sufficient quantity to raise the, the bread. Uh, if you look closely, there is little bubbles in it. That means that it is ready. I also did this thing called the float test to make sure that it's ready. Um, in essence, you put a little bit in, in some water. If it floats, it's ready to raise your bread. Um, I mixed this leaven this morning um, at around 6 a.m. It's now about 12 hours later. It's a little past uh, the, the amount of time that I should have let it, uh, but uh, it should be good to go. Um, and uh, now we go, first next step is also mixing. So the basic recipe for a country loaf includes 1,000 grams of flour, which is 900 grams of white bread flour, 100 grams of whole wheat flour, 200 grams of starter, um, 700 grams of water, purified water, to hopefully around 70 degrees, 70 to 80 degrees. Um, you also, we're also gonna be adding some salt a little bit later with, with a little extra water, I'll show you how to incorporate that. But in essence, we're just gonna start creating the mix. Right now I have pre-measured 900 grams of white flour. You wanna make sure to use a scale. Um, you can't use, you know, measuring cups. It's a scale, it's the only way to do it. It's gotta be exact. This is not like, you know, cooking a soup where you, you know, add a little of this, a little of that. It's gotta be precise. It's just the way it is. It's the science of baking. So I have 900 grams of white flour here. And I'm gonna zero out the scale right now. Add my 200 grams of leaven, which I have here. I'm gonna pour that in. My remaining 100 grams of holy flour, I'm going to zero it out. I'm going to add, I'm going to zero out the scale, I'm going to add 700 grams of water. Water is heavy, so you got to be careful. And it's harder to remove, so you got to be more careful. 700 grams. Basically, you have the entire mixture right here. The only thing that's missing is salt. We're going to add the salt a little bit later. The reason why you don't want to add the salt now is because if you do, uh, the salt, since it has a, 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 a tendency to draw water out, you want to make sure that the, the wheat molecules are properly um, hydrated. So you want to add the salt after the what's called the auto leaf period, which is the flour absorbing all the water. So basically, you just want to get your hands in here and mix it together. It's nasty. It's like mushy, but that's the only way to do it. Um, it's going to look like a mess too, like a shaggy mess. You're not going to believe that this at one point is going to turn into bread, but it does. Um, and in essence, besides the salt, what you've seen added right, right there was the leaven. The, the water and the salt is, is the entirety of the recipe. You can add additional things to the bread um, you know, at a later point if you want to like add some flavor to it. Um, but right now, this is just the basic white country bread. Recipe. So I'm mixing it. What you want to do is you want to make sure that all the flour is is mixed in and not completely dry. With time and the absorption, it'll all get much nicely, much nicer incorporated. That's it in a nutshell. Let me just grab this corner here. Now, by the nature of this type of bread, it's a very wet dough, it's very sticky. So instead of kneading it using the traditional method of kneading it on a board like you see on TV or in other cooking shows, the way we're gonna knead it is by folding just a, a folding, um, a stretch and fold technique. That basically what you're doing is that over a long period of time, you're, you're stretching and folding the dough in 30 minute intervals to kind of like work the gluten that way. 
And as you see, it works quite nice. So that's pretty much it. So this is mixed as well as I need it to be mixed just so that there's no dry uh, portions on it. And that's it, you don't need to do anything else but this. Then um, we're gonna wait 30 minutes, which is the auto lease period. Then we're gonna have the salt and incorporate it in there. And then begins the, the, the bulb rise. So the 30 minute auto lease period is over. This is what it looks like. Doesn't look very spectacular. It looks like, like almost like oatmeal that's been sitting around for a while, but you can see already that the auto lease period, you can see how it before it was like really shaggy. Now it's, it's already, the gluten structures are starting to develop. What we want to do is we want to incorporate the salt. Um, so what I have is 20 grams of salt and I'm sprinkling this up on top and 50 grams of water to incorporate it. And let me tell you, this is easy to forget. If you don't remember to do this, you're going to have bread without salt and no one's going to want to eat it. So uh, the reason why you put the water in with the salt is that you can actually get in there and kind of like mush it together. And the idea is basically they just start squishing it together like this and incorporate the salt. It's gonna break apart a little bit or get kind of weird and slimy, but you gotta work it just a little bit and it'll come back together. As you can see already, it's starting to look more doughy. So at this stage, what we have here is, is the, you know, everything's been mixed together. We have the beginning of the bulk fermentation or the bulk rise. Um, it's a process by which um, you develop the, the gluten in the bread so that the bread, you know, rises, has a nice spring to it, and it's the consistency of bread. Um, the way that you do that with other methods, uh, when it's typically a drier dough, that you knead it, you knead it on the, on the, on the board, um, and you work it, you work it for, you know, 15, 20 minutes until you develop all the gluten. This is a different way of doing it. Um, because it's such a wet dough, it's really hard to handle on a board. There's a method called the slap and fold method, which, which works, but it's, it's, it's not necessary, especially when you have a bread like this. The stretch and fold is by far the best way to do it, in my opinion. Um, in essence, it's a three hour period at least. Sometimes it could take it to four hours. The thing with this kind of bread, or with any bread is that um, you know you gotta you gotta listen to the bread you can't you know rush it you can only try to control the environment to hope things happen the way you want it to happen but uh, the bread's gonna tell you when it's ready but it's typically about a three hour period what you want to do is that every 30 minutes you want to um, do a stretch and fold to develop the gluten and then put it back for another 30 minutes or so you want to do this in an environment that's relatively warm about 80 degrees um, you know, most kitchens may be 80 degrees. I'm in Miami here. If I had the 80, if my house at 80 degrees, I'd blow my brains out. I keep it at 70 at the very, at the very warmest. So what I do is I put it in the oven um, and I just turn the oven on just for a second, just to raise the temperature a little bit. And it keeps about a, a you know, a solid 80, 81 degrees um, in the oven for that period of time. And I find this is the best environment. Um, it, it also speeds up the process just a little bit. If you go too hot, then you can kill the yeast that's, that's, that's occurring in here and you can make it happen too fast and then that's not good either. So about 80 degrees is what's recommended. Um, so that begins now. The first 30 minute period has passed. I'm not gonna show you this yet because it's not that interesting to see just yet. Um, but uh, what, what I wanna do is, is do the first stretch and folds. Uh, the easiest way to do it is you get, uh, you wet your hand. So uh, you get your hand a little moist like that and you dig all the way into the bottom of the, of, of the mass and you lift it up high. You can see how it's stretching, that's the gluten. You give it a few of these stretches and folds, just like that. As you can see, it's much different than, than, than original. That's because the gluten's starting to work on it. And as you can see, with each stretch and fold that I'm doing, it gets a little bit less uh, elastic and that means that I'm working it and expanding the gluten and then now I just need to let it rest a little bit so that's about it you don't need to do much more to it um, back in the um, in the warm spot for another 30 minutes and then we'll do it again here we have the second uh, stretch and fold I'm gonna do the same procedure as before with my hand reach in grab the bottom 
pull it up, as you can see, look at the stretch you're getting on this now. You're now getting the gluten structure being formed. Stretch is much, much nicer. It's a kind of cohesive dough. It's starting to get a little fluffy. So you can tell the yeast is working. And that's about all it'll let me do. You can see it won't stretch anymore. It'll start to break. That's pretty much it. Back in the warm place. So it's been about two and a half hours since we started the bulk fermentation. I've already uh, done about four um, stretch and folds. This is gonna be the fifth. I wanted to give you an indication of what it looks like. So it's already very airy and, and fluffy. You gotta be very careful at this stage because after the second hour, um, you don't wanna collapse it too much, but you can see what, you know, how much the, how much the gluten has has worked on this. It's now, you know, it's almost ready. It still has a little bit to go. And again, this is without any of that heavy kneading on, on the board or with the slap folds, this is just doing these turns. You gotta be very gentle. You wanna make sure you don't degas it too much. That's about it. I'm gonna give it another 30 minutes or so and um, and check back and see how we're doing. Okay, so it's been over three hours. Um, the, the dough has risen probably around 20, 25 to 30%, which is exactly where you want it to be. If you notice the side here, which is the reason why I used a clear container, on the side here, you can see the air bubbles. It's really nice and airy. I see some bubbles forming on the surface here. It's a good indication that, that this, this dough is ready to go. Um, it's got the right consistency. So the next step is what we want to do is do the initial, the initial shaping uh, of the loaves. Um, and, um, and, and the way you do that is you flour the surface slightly, um, your, your, your working surface, which in this case is just my cutting board here. Uh, you, wanna, you don't want to incorporate a lot of uh, flour into the dough at this point. Um, so you want to use as little dough as you need as, as needed. This is a, a bowl scraper here, which I which I always use, and you just want to turn this over or turn the dough out into, into the surface of my cutting board. And it comes out pretty cleanly. Obviously not 100 percent clean, but clean enough. And then this here is the is the dough mass that we have using a bench scraper, which is what this is, uh, what you want to do is you want to try to divide it in half as best you can. Sometimes I weigh it, sometimes I don't. Right now, I'm just going to eyeball it. So I'm just going to cut it in half to form my two loaves. And there's one loaf and there's the other loaf. And here I have the two kind of like masses right here. What I want to do is I want to start doing the initial shaping. So I'm going to lightly flour the top of each of the, the masses here and then flour my hands so the dough doesn't really stick to my hands and starting with the top the, the top dough here I'm going to turn it on the side on, its, on, its, on the floured side um, turn both of them on the floured side and then start to work it. The initial shaping is real simple. Let me get some more flour in my hands. Basically, you want to bring the dough onto itself. So I grab one side here, and again, gently, you don't want to degas this too much. It is you just want to start creating what looks like a loaf. So you're folding it onto itself so that the bottom now becomes part onto itself, like that. And then you flip it onto the seam side, which is on the bottom. And then you begin using the bench scraper, twisting it. And every time you twist, because of the tension that's on the board, as you can see, the, it's starting to form a, a, the outer part or the crust, and it's starting to create like tension on the outside. And that's what you want. You want to, you want to create, again, this is the initial shaping. And just by giving it this twist, I'm creating this tension of, uh, for, of the outside. And that's about all I need right now. I'm gonna flour my hands a little bit more to the second uh, piece. 
Again, unsticking a little bit from the board using the scraper. In, again, into itself like this, not too aggressive. Bringing it in like that. Then flipping it and beginning these turns using the bench scraper. Another way that you can do it, again, with flower hands, is, is a tuck method. You turn and you tuck. And once again, you're trying to create some tension on the outside. So you can do this with your hand just like I'm doing it here. And you can see it's the same thing. If you put too much flour, you're not, I mean, the fact that there's not a lot of flour on the, on the board creates some tension, which allows you to pull it and tighten the skin of, of the dough. So here we go. Here are two pre-shaping loaves. They're looking pretty good. So we've kind of like worked the gluten a little bit in, the, in, these, in these doughs. So now what we want to do is let it relax again. This is called the bench rest, about 20, 30 minutes. What you want to do is you want to keep it you know covered and just let it relax for a period of time we'll come back in in about 30 minutes or so and then put them in the in the baskets for the for the final proofing stage so about 25 30 minutes have passed this is the the dough that's rested um as you can see that it's still held its shape pretty decently uh, but it has relaxed a little bit. Um, what we're gonna do now is the is the final shaping. Um, and I'm doing it up close so you can get a good idea of, of what it looks like. Um, you're gonna lightly flour again the surface of the, of the loaves. Again, not incorporating too much dough. Flour the hands. I'm gonna start with this one farthest away from me. So you, you wanna lift it off the, off the bench and flip it. And again, the, the floured surface is down at the bottom. And what you want to do is that you want to grab this outside um, so, um, uh, flap here and fold it in. Again, the idea is to create some tension on the outside. Gonna stretch this a little bit, fold it in on itself. Again, we're creating this, this little package, right? All with the idea of creating tension. This tension at the end of the day, what ends up doing is creating a oven spring, so a bounce in the oven. And then finally, you grab this and you put it all the way over the end, and then now you have a seam right here, and you flip it, and with your hand, you do the same turning that we were doing before. Again, you can do it with the bench scraper if you want. All you have to do is really just twist and tuck, twist and tuck, and, and you can start feeling the tension of the dough you can see how nice the dough is here because you can see little air bubbles that are on here so you know that now you can there's a possibility that you do this too much and if you do this too much it'll tear so you want to do it just so that it's tight enough but not so tight that it tears and i think that's good right there i'm gonna do the same thing with this one flip it Again, gently bring it in, bring it in, sit out, bring it in, and then this side here, bring it over to the top, flip it, and then begin the twists and tuck. Again, you can do this with, with the bench scraper too. Sometimes it even helps. is a shaped round loaf so now we have the loaves that have been the, the final shaping we want to put them into the baskets there's a couple ways to do this you could use what's called the banneton which is like the professional bread basket you can get it at any store Williams Sonoma Crate and Barrel whatever or you can order them online they're not that expensive um, and it's the classic way of of proofing the, 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 final, the final product. Um, before I had this, I used this $3 colander that I bought at, a, at, a, at, a, at the grocery store. Basically, this works the same. So what you wanna do is, in the case of, 
of the colander, you want to use it as, as, the, as the, the vessel where, where, the, where the final rise is going to take place. Obviously, there's a, you, know, you can't just put it in here because the bread will like, seep through. If you want to use a clean kitchen towel, which I have here, and you press it in, the clean kitchen towel, okay? Then what you want to do is that you want to flour the inside of it. And obviously, the reason why you're flouring it is that you don't want the bread to stick. At this point, you know, you can liberally add it because you're not incorporating it into the dough. It's just gonna be on the outer surface. And, at, and after it bakes, you can brush it off if you want. It's also gonna add a nice color to it, but you definitely don't want the dough to stick to the, to the towel or the, or the basket. So you flour it generously, be very gentle with it, because if you tap, it's all gonna fall over the place. In this particular case, I'm gonna flour my hands a little bit. I'm gonna give this a final couple of turns. Flip it onto my hand and just gently lay it into the basket. First one is done, let me put it aside. The next one, I'm gonna use this banneton without anything on it. You wanna liberally, like I said, liberally dust it. Some people say you don't need to liberally do it. I liberally do it. I don't want it to stick. Also, the bannetons, because of this bamboo structure that it has on it, it gives it a cool little kind of design on the outside of the, of the loaf. These round loaves are called bulls. And again, you can do this any shape you want, but I find that these are the, the easiest because of the way we're going to bake them later on. Again, I'm going to give it a little final twist and shape. Tighten it up a little bit. And flip it and gently lay it onto the basket. Now, the next uh, stage is called the, the, the final rise. There's a couple of ways you could do that. You can do it the same way we did the bulk fermentation in a warm environment for about two or three hours and it rises and you bake it. What I'm gonna do is it's late, I wanna go to sleep. You can put these in the fridge and that retards the dough for a period of time. It also rises, but it also allows the, 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 the bread or the dough to develop acidic, kind of the real sourdough type of flavors. That's what I personally like. So I tend to retard the dough every single time. Basically, you just put it in the fridge for up to 12 hours, no longer than that, and then you bake it straight from the fridge. We'll get to that tomorrow. So it is now the next day. And how can you tell it's the next day? I'm wearing a different shirt. But I've taken um, one of the, the, the baskets out of the refrigerator so I can set it up and score it and get it in the oven. Before you do that, obviously you have to set the oven uh, and preheat the oven. Uh, the best way to, to cook these loaves is inside a cast iron Dutch oven or an enamel Dutch oven. The reason being that these, this kind of bread needs a really hot environment, but also needs a moist environment in the first 20 minutes of cooking to give an opportunity for the, the loaf to rise um, and, and get that oven spring that we, that we want to kind of like lift the bread up. If we put the bread in a hot oven without a moist environment, the outside seals and kind of like holds the crust in place. So we do this, um, so the way that commercial bakeries uh, bake is that they have these commercial ovens that can maintain a really hot temperature and also inject steam in the first 20 minutes of cooking to create that moist environment. We can do that in a regular home oven, but once you start introducing steam by spraying water into it, you reduce the temperature of the oven and you know it does work, but it's not as, as efficient. So what, what a cast iron cooker does, a Dutch oven, is that it creates um, a, a sealed environment so that the, the, the water that's naturally in the bread creates steam and it's trapped in that environment. So you're creating that same high steam environment in a really hot environment inside the Dutch oven. Um, I'm using what's called a combo cooker, which basically it's a Dutch oven, but it has a shallow pan and a deeper pan. It makes it easier to get the, the loaf in and out. So um, what we're gonna do now is, is, um, is un, unmold, I guess, the, the the, the dough that's been sitting here. 
I have a, a, a pizza peel here and you'll see why um, I use this. I have uh, an oven mitt, which is a high temperature one, but even with this, it's not enough. The, the cast iron cooker is about a billion degrees. If you touch it with, with your bare hand, you will get a serious burn. Um, so you wanna make sure you have plenty of protection when you're handling these things. Um, and I have a piece of parchment paper and I'll show you why I have that as well. So what I do is in order to unmold this, um, is I grab the peel with the parchment paper, put it on, um, on the basket and flip it just like that. And then what I do is with the box cutter, I just cut around the basket just to create a little a circle and get rid of the excess parchment paper. I don't need all this. Because of the type of cooker that I have, I want a, you know just a circle. I don't need anything more than that. And that should be the job. And yeah, it doesn't have to be perfect. This has to be good enough. So, they're carefully lifting. And there it is. As you can see, the, the banneton has left these little ridges, which creates a really cool shape. So what we want to do now is before it goes in the oven, or right before it goes in the oven, we want to score it. And the reason is, is that the bread at some point is going to naturally, um, it wants to, when it expands, it's going to want to break open at some particular, you know, point. You want to, by creating the score yourself, you're telling the bread where to, where to actually open up and you can create like some designs. I'm using a razor blade. You can buy a, you know, a French lame, which is a, a little holder for the, for the, for the razor blade. I'm just gonna use a razor blade in my hand. You gotta be careful. You wanna make a shallow cut, you can do whatever. I mean, there's different, go on YouTube and you can see different ways to score your bread. I'm gonna show you just a quick and easy way. You can just do one down the middle, you can do a square, but I'm gonna do, try to do a little design here. So starting on here, I'm going to create one deliberate slash. It's gonna open up that side. And then I'm gonna to try to make little design here on this side it's gonna give it like a little wheat shaft look to it that's about it next is going into the oven so the oven is now at 500 degrees and so are the cast iron pieces that are inside and as you can see, this is the shallow piece. What you want to do is carefully is to slide the bread into the shallow piece and then quickly cover it. hopefully and close the oven you want to reduce the temperature to 400 degrees or 450 for the first 20 minutes and then we're gonna after the first 20 minutes we're gonna lift off and open up the combo cooker so the first 20 minutes are up I'm gonna check on and open up the there's the combo cooker I'm gonna lift off the lid take a look at at the loaf there as you can see there's quite a big oven spring there it's opened up nicely on the seam and close the oven again and have it continue baking for another 25 minutes okay so the breads come out of the oven um, I left it in an extra five minutes or so to give it a little bit of a deeper deeper color you can bake uh, the bread uh, you know a little extra if you want to get a, a, a deeper you know brown color and even some slightly burnt pieces on here which is actually really attractive it's still really hot you want to make sure that you keep it in a cooling rack if you don't have a cooling rack what i've done in the past is just take one of the one of the racks from the oven and, and laid it across something and just put them on there if you don't have that what they do in the bakery sometimes is they just stack them side to side you don't want to have it just flat on something because you've just spent you know, two days making bread, and then you're putting it on, on a, a hot bread on a, on a surface, um, you know, the heat is gonna make it soft. 
the idea is, is that you have a really super, super hard crust. As you can see here, it's still a little hot, but here's the bottom of it. Um, if you can tell, um, the, the crust has these little bubbles, which is exactly what you want to see. Um, as the bread cools, um, you're going to start hearing like a crackling sound. That means it's contracting and, and it's becoming unbelievably awesome. Another way you can tell if it's done um, is just by tapping it. Sounds hollow. It's done. If you want, you can stick a thermometer in there. Um, I find that you, know, you don't need it. If it looks like this, that means it's done. Um, once I took this out, I set the oven again to 500 degrees, bringing it up to temperature, bake the next loaf. Um, and then I'll just show you what that looks like when it comes out. Okay, so here we have the final loaf it just came out of the oven literally a second ago. Um, it's piping hot, um, but you can see how well the, the, the bread rose in the oven. Um, that means I had a good active starter, um, that I had a good tension when I was doing the, the shaping, and that we created a, a nice environment for, for the bread to, uh, to, to grow in a moist environment the first 20, 20 minutes of baking. One thing that you want to do, without a shadow of a doubt, as much as you want to break into this bread right now, is you got to let it completely cool. Um, if you cut into the bread before it's finished cooling, you're going to get a gummy crumb, which is the, the, the inside of the bread, and you don't want that. Let it completely cool um, before you cut into it. Um, use a good bread knife, and um, I'm going to post um, the, all the instructions and the ingredients in the description below, and I hope you enjoyed it. Um, Give me, put any comments you want on the bottom, as long as they're good. If you want to send me a negative comment, just write it on the back of a $20 bill and send it to my house, and uh, I'll address that for you. Okay, thank you.